Can you ready, Bea? Let's give um, two more minutes to people to join and we start officially at 12.05. Happy Thursday, everyone. Please let us know where you're joining from in the chat. Lots of familiar names here. The pressure's getting higher and higher and higher. It's all these people I look up to are showing up. We have Brooklyn in the house. We have Puerto Rico in the house. Adam, I want to know where you're joining us from. We have Alexandria, Virginia in the house. Pennsylvania, Miami. Need somebody from California. <laughs> Delhi in, uh, from India. Wow, it's Twin great. cities, Minnesota. Gonna be an international crowd, Dan. Uh, later, early for Nisha, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> Chicago, oh. Orange County, California. I know that's endearing to your heart, Dan. San Francisco, yeah. Brooklyn. Okay, it's twelve oh five, Dan. All right. The, sh the show is yours. Everyone enjoy. We love we love your questions either in the Q&A and chat and Paul Gallagher and myself. We're going to make sure that Dan answers. So put him on the on the hot seat. Enjoy Dan oh. and Dan break a leg. I, I will do my best. So um, can everybody hear me OK? Adam, since you're the one that's kept your camera on, you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Great. Well, um, I always get very anxious with these, mostly because not because I don't think I have had some experience in the work and the things that we're going to talk about, but mostly because I have such respect for your time. Um, and many of you either work with or for or around uh, nonprofits and social impact organizations. And I, I recognize that every minute of your day is precious. Uh, it's the one resource we can't seem to find more of. Uh, and so I just uh, I really I really hope that I do a, a good job of making good use of your time today. I will make a commitment to that effect in just a moment. Uh, but I wanted to start off just for saying thank you and, and expressing my gratitude for the conversation that we're going to have today. So I am going to do this a little differently than we sometimes do. And I'm going to use a Miro board. So I'm going to be looking that direction for a good bit of the time because uh, it's on that screen. And then I'll try to go back and forth. But uh, you're going to see me navigating around this board quite a bit, and uh, if I zoom all the way out, you're going to basically see the full run of show for today. So uh, we tried to create this in a format that is shareable, so that if anybody wants this content in uh, afterwards, uh, reach out. We're happy to share the board with you, so you can use this to whatever extent that you want. There is no information in here that isn't uh, allowed to be shared. And we're intentionally not naming specific customers just so we can talk about the concepts more generically and, and dig into details. So um, so there's a, a lot of content to cover in a relatively short period of time. I'll keep an eye on the clock and maybe we have to cut it short. I would much rather be interrupted 20 or 30 times during the course of the discussion than get through what I wanted to talk about. So feel free to put your hand up or hit the chat or anything like that. And, uh, and we'll go we'll go according to what the participants want to cover. So. Uh, the title of today's webinar is Transform Your Nonprofit's Operations with Technology. Uh, I, I also want to say we know that the technology doesn't transform your organization by itself and that it's the humans and the human power technology that, that actually make it happen and make it sustain. Uh, but that being said, that's that's how we decided to title it today. So my commitment to you is, is threefold. Uh, first is... Um, that I hope that by the time we finish today, you feel um, more hopeful about the existing solutions in the marketplace. There's a lot going on in the world of nonprofit technology. Uh, things are coming, things are going, things are being purchased, things are being shut down, there's mergers, there's acquisitions, there's all kinds of stuff happening. And it, it's about it's about as clear as mud from where we sit. And uh, as has always been the case, you got to weigh and balance all the opportunities. But hopefully uh, you'll, you'll feel more hopeful about what we see as, as the great possibilities in the future. Um, the second is that I hope you'll feel maybe a little bit better informed about where to start 
if you haven't already started or maybe where to restart if you're kind of on version two or three of the process based on some examples that we're able to share. So, so we're going to spend a lot of time talking about those examples today so that um, we can put this conversation in context. Uh, and then hopefully you also feel uh, eager to, to kickstart that journey and, and also get the AI journey started as well. So we'll come back to these at the end and see, see how we did. Um, this is our final punchline. So that's, that's where we're going to finish the presentation. Um, if we haven't met before, I'll just spend 20 seconds talking about myself. Uh, that's a, a picture of me with the SDG pinwheel. The SDGs are woven into pretty much every layer of fabric that there is here at Threshold.World. I uh, am lucky enough to serve as the CEO and one of the co-founders of the organization, uh, and I will do my best to represent the prideful work that our, our team does every day, but uh, I want to be clear, I'm not taking credit for any of it, so I get to be a spectator for, for that work. We'll also cover a bit of what we do uh, with B.World in the course of today's discussion as well. Um, if you don't know our, our company and our organization, um, it's called Threshold.World. Some people call it threshold, some people call it two. Uh, feel free to make up your own acronyms. Uh, but this is the second draft of our attempts to serve the nonprofit and social impact space. Uh, we work exclusively with Microsoft technologies, though we do integrate with anything else, uh, but we only build with Microsoft technologies. Um, <clears throat> and we do everything on what's called the common data model for nonprofits, which I'm going to talk about in the course of today. Uh, we respect the organizations that uh, we are lucky enough to work with and we try to think like a product company that builds things that last and we have a, a diversity of different partnerships that we're very intentional about choosing uh, which include a commitment to carbon negativity for the life of our company uh, our partnerships with microsoft and, and others like the net hope um, crew as well so that's a bit about us just a few quick facts and figures the company was started in 2018 but we've really only been doing project related work for about three and a half years so everything we're going to talk about after is just about that and um, there's about just shy of 30 of us we finished about 40 projects in three years we have about 20 nonprofit customers to date and we generally work um, with organizations that are that are focused on latin america the us and um, emia uh, we do have customers outside of that, uh, but it's tough for us to reach that far from a time zone perspective because pretty much everybody in Threshold World is based either in Puerto Rico or somewhere between Texas and Vermont. Um, and so for us to provide the level of engagement and service that we we can today, that's that's uh, that's generally where we focus. You you doesn't mean you can't have international operations, but the primary domiciles of our engagements fall in those places. So um, hopefully that gives you a really quick whistle stop tour of where we are. And I wanted to just spend a couple of minutes on uh, what has this journey been like? How did we get here uh, for the last five and a half years or so? And our story is very woven together uh, with Microsoft's story and the Microsoft Tech for Social Impact team and the Microsoft Philanthropies team. And along this journey line that many of you may have seen if you've met with their team or with other partners in the Microsoft ecosystem, there have been a few different major milestones uh, that have happened, and, and, and I'm sure many more to come. So I'm going to talk about uh, briefly this thing called the NGO reference model, which was really one of the core uh, community-driven initiatives that spurred the work around the common data model, which will be the second topic I cover. And then we're going to talk about how that's getting manifest inside of um, nonprofits and healthcare institutions uh, in those specific examples. So this is a little bit of a buildup. Um, it'll take me a couple of minutes to do the NGO reference model. If you know all about that, feel free to tune out and double task for a minute. Then I'm going to cover the common data model in a little bit more depth because that's the foundational data layer of all of the work that we empower uh, and that we are learning how to do with our, our nonprofit partners. And then we'll get into the fundraising and engagement and Microsoft Cloud for nonprofit examples um, shortly thereafter. So the story started because they're uh, with the NGO reference model, uh, and I put the website just below this, there were a whole bunch of people from a bunch of organizations, operators, you know, some of them technologists, who uh, had a feeling that they're, they're, they, would be, um, they would be the beneficiaries of, and their teams would gain significant benefit if they could develop a common understanding about how nonprofits operate right, overall. Not that everybody's cut from the same cloth, uh, but that if we could figure out how um, the value chain of goods and services flow through nonprofit organizations and what primary activities they engage in to try to achieve their mission in service of whoever their um, stakeholders are, 
that that would actually help everybody. And so uh, many years ago, this group of, in my view, heroes came together and created this thing called the NGO reference model to try to advance the humanitarian sector primarily, forward, vault them forward faster through a common understanding of operations and activities. Um, and then also publish that open source for anybody to use in any sector so that they could pay it forward. And that was awesome. Uh, and over the course of a few years of people using this, the, that group of people, um, you know, said like, this is great. And now we can talk to each other about how we work with a common language about our activities. But we, we need to go further than this because we're using more and more technology. And now we need to try to understand the data and each other's use of that data and how it flows through these processes and activities. And what they found was that they were speaking completely different languages, not languages in the context of French and English and Arabic and so on and so forth, but the terminology they used to describe the information and the knowledge that was in their, in, was in their systems was really holding them back, both within their organizations as well as across organizations. Uh, and all the tech vendors were saying, well, we have a standard and we have a standard and we have a standard and our standard's the best, et cetera. And it was just, um, it made a, a great step forward, but it started to get really messy. And so the next step was uh, that same group of people uh, said, we need a common language for nonprofit data. And as a result of that initiative coming from the sector, they came up with this idea of a common data model for nonprofit, uh, which is a design for data and its relationship within the context of nonprofit activities. So I won't go into this in great deal, deal, detail because I've covered it in the past and there's tons of information out there about it, but you want to think about the CDM for nonprofits or the nonprofit common data model or the common data model for nonprofit and people uh, describe it as something that was stewarded by and then invested in by Microsoft and hats off to them for stepping up, but it's not owned by Microsoft and it's not um, <clears throat> evolved by Microsoft, it's, it's owned by the community. Right. And it can be manifest in any technology, including platforms that compete sometimes with Microsoft. And so the two key points of this were develop a common data language around the common processes that can be adapted and evolved by the people who actually do the work right, in a very human way. So that's a quick primer on the common data model for nonprofits. Um, that's a little philosophical. This is what it actually looks like. So it's about 150 tables about 1,500 fields, uh, lots of relationships between those different entities and all of the metadata descriptors that go uh, along with that. If anybody wants to geek out on the CDM at any point, please reach out. I'm very happy to do it as are many members of our team and others that are, that are in the ecosystem as well. So the idea then is, well, okay, data models are great. Activities are great. We're building up the stack now, but uh, how can Microsoft actually make that more relevant to the nonprofit market? So they began to ingest that design into what now is called the Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit, which is kind of our last step in this journey. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into great marketing detail around the Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit because I'd rather have you see it in the context of the examples, but the intent is to be able to provide that full life cycle support uh, where all of the different services that they offer, as well as all of the other platforms and apps that are API friendly that you can connect with, can use that common data and language to their advantage to try to improve operations and um, achieve mission outcomes more rapidly. So there's plenty out there uh, in the market on that, but the best picture that I think is available is this one, which is that there's a bunch of different services that can be used to know your donors and supporters better with the intent of raising more funds to fuel your mission, right? There's a bunch of apps and services that are out there, some of which are Microsoft and some of which are produced in the ecosystem around them that are about designing and delivering more effective programs, which is something I think all of us want to do, including us here at Threshold. Uh, and then there's also things that are out there like Power BI that can be used to try to improve your decision support and aggregation of information. Power BI is one of many viable and uh, reputable tools on the market. Uh, but this is the picture that Microsoft uses to describe the primary services. And you'll see the most important thing at the bottom is that it's all, all those services have access to the data that's in that common data model for nonprofits, which is gonna be one of the unifying themes we get to. So with that, I'm gonna take a breath and just check the chat and see if there are any questions. And then we're gonna get to the fun part, which is the examples. 
no questions thus far in the chat, but if everyone wants to raise their hand and ask a specific question about the intro or context, please do. Great. Thanks, Pat. So um, I know I'm zoomed way out. I'm going to zoom in in a second, but I wanted to give you a view of sort of what are what are we going to look at over the course of the next probably 10 to 15 minutes or so with each of these examples. And, and also, um, please feel free to put up your hand if you feel like I'm glazing over part of it that is relevant to you and you want to dig in a little deeper because I'm happy to do that. So what we did was we put together five different examples of ways that organizations are, are progressing along their journey of leveraging Microsoft related technologies and the common data model for nonprofit to try to raise more money, accelerate mission outcomes and improve the lives and livelihoods of the people that um, that work inside their organizations. So we're going to talk about conservation. We're going to talk about accessibility. Uh, we're going to talk about humanitarian aid. Uh, we're going to talk about healthcare, and we're also going to talk about education. So each of these lines is essentially a different a, a different high level journey line for each of those. And I'll cover, you know, what was the high level challenge the organization was facing? What were the intended impacts of, of what they wanted to come out of the process with? What was the specific output of the project? Like what work actually got done and how might that help them achieve the intended impact? And then in each case, I'm going to zoom in on what are the things that they actually use to make that possible and which ones did they not use? And then I'll close each one of them out with like, well, what's what's next with this organization? Like, What are they going to do next? Um, and then once I go through all of them, I'm going to come back around and kind of show you the unifying what we see as the kind of three primary unifying themes across this this basis as a representative example of the um, 20 or so customers that we're lucky enough to work with. So. First one is a conservation nonprofit. Um, hopefully my use of color will help remind us of which causal area we're talking about. This, uh, this is one of our earliest um, customers. They took a chance on us uh, when we were just beginning to do direct work in the marketplace. And the way that they expressed their challenge when we first met them was that they had, they had a bunch of non-integrated systems um, that were causing a lot of inefficiencies uh, for their team members and they saw that that wasn't going to be a sustainable foundation for the organization as they were anticipating and in the early phases of pretty significant growth, given the area of focus that they they um, they have as their mission, which is around conservation and protecting um, um, public lands. And so, um, so that was what they came with. And and the intended impact of this project was to try to unify operations all the way through the organization, from the front office all the way to the back office. Um, they were planning on including fundraising, grants, contracts, ERP, all of their front office productivity applications like email, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they wanted to do that in a stepwise fashion, right? And that they, the end goal of that was to try to unify the operations so that the organization could grow more effectively. Right. But they also knew they couldn't do it all at once. So um, they started with one phase. So the project output for the first phase was uh, transitioning um, from their legacy fundraising technology into fundraising and engagement within the Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit. And then in parallel to that, and with other partner organizations that they selected, they also moved their front office and they also moved their ERP into a, a Microsoft related partner um, that works uh, quite a lot in the nonprofit space and provides really unique fund accounting capabilities. So these three projects all took longer than any of us expected. They were all harder than any of us expected. And there was lots of learning to be had within it. Um, and there still is, is quite a lot to do in the future as I'll talk about in the roadmap. But these are the things that, that, that have actually been in use for this specific project. So um, they use Microsoft 365 for the front office. They chose the cloud for nonprofit for fundraising, which also includes sales. Um, and then they used Business Central, right, for their core back office operations as they tried to unify their ERP capabilities. Um, they also chose the real time marketing um, features and, and the historic outbound marketing capabilities for Microsoft um, because of their unified connectivity to the CRM application. Um, they're using customer voice for surveys. And then a, a variety of other power platform related um, capabilities for customizations. So um, Kyle, thanks for the celebratory icon. And what were some of the challenges for the conservation org? Um, the front office, 
uh, we didn't do that project. So in all honesty, I want to just kind of skip the surface and talk about what we saw uh, from it. The I think the point that's really the first point I'll make is that for the CRM projects to work really, really well, there's a huge advantage if the front office capabilities are either already in Microsoft 365 or the, the organization's made a choice to move um, to Microsoft 365. Many, many of the, it doesn't mean you can't get all the benefits of the platform by any measure, but the interoperability between the front office capabilities and M365 and the cloud for nonprofit and the other services is, it's, there's no other company on the planet that offers that from my perspective. And so that was a significant benefit. Um, the challenge was that they had a lot of old stuff in a lot of different places. And uh, one, of, one great example of that is documents. Right. So for organizations that do a lot of work with documents, either for fundraising proposals or grants and contract agreements, collecting that, organizing it, and then getting it connected back into this new kind of relational structure that's unified is a, is a huge challenge right? and finding all of that content. Another one is um, that's I think also worth mentioning is that the, many of the team members in this org, as included in our organization, is the same. I'm as guilty of this as anybody else. Is we love our spreadsheets, right? Like that's why we put that in the title of and the subject of the webinar. It's like we love our spreadsheets, uh, and they're re incredibly utilitarian for us. And so, getting the users to transition from some of those spreadsheets to connected spreadsheets with the CRM system. Uh, has been a challenge and continues to be a work in progress. I think incredible progress has been made on that front to demonstrate the value of, of doing the work inside the systems, but that connectivity to Excel uh, for things like pipeline management and so forth can, can be, you know, you can be an and instead of an or. So, awesome. So what's next for this org? Um, when we take a step back and kind of check the roadmap, you know, the, there's lots there's lots of opportunities to extend the core functionality that's already deployed. Um, I sort of see this organization as having three of the four legs of the stool in place. They have the front office taken care of, they have the ERP side of the house taken care of, and they have a foundational CRM to get the money in the door um, across all of the channels of fundraising. And, and next step is really that next big step, which is going to be a, a significant one, which is connecting to programs and projects. Right, and all of the downstream work. So um, that's a significant effort and one that they're they're taking you know, with the appropriate level of seriousness. And it's a really exciting project for whoever gets to be part of that. So that's our first example. Um, hopefully this is getting close to the mark for, for you all and not going, it's got the right level of depth. And again, please feel free to, to jump in if you have any other questions. Um, <clears throat> There's a second example as an organization that's focused on uh, people living um, with challenging diseases and, pro and, and, and helping them uh, make sure that they can live their best lives through the context of uh, the time that they have remaining and at the same time working uh, very, very hard to find cures for those, those challenges. Um, and so one of the major things that they do is they provide equipment and services and support uh, to individuals uh, from the time of diagnosis all the way through to whatever the transition might be. And so um, when we first met this organization, they had, uh, they had done an incredible job of going from essentially like being brand new to a rapid state of evolution and growth in a very scrappy way. Right. They had they had been able to use sort of best in breed tools that were appropriate for the organization at those different stages and made great choices. But they were starting to get to the point where it wasn't holding together as well as they needed it to. And they were also concerned about the, the um, privacy of the information and the, and the potential security risks related to that. So the apps just weren't keeping up with the organizational growth um, and they, they really needed to invest in secure, scalable um, infrastructure specifically. Or, or they would get them kind of to the next level um, around protecting the information of the individuals and, and parties that they were working with. So the intended outcome or the intended impact of the project was really, you know, to take a step back and, and begin to rethink how the organization could operate um, at scale, right? And, and to make sure that the systems would um, support that intended growth path um, in service of, of their stakeholders. And so uh, the first step of that was kind of a rip and replace, 
This organization also moved front offices um, through to Office 365 um, or Microsoft, what's now Microsoft 365 through another partner. And then they also wanted to start with the, the thing that was closest to the people that they uh, serve, which is really that digital engagement layer between the organization and the outside world. So that was um, in traditional terms, you might call that customer service. Um, so we'll get to get into a little bit more detail of that when we look at the ingredients in a moment. Um, so the main project output was this uh, sort of foundational layer of the common data model uh, and, a, and a connected CRM using components of the cloud for nonprofit um, and, a, and a high fidelity accessible certified portal right, that allows people to engage digitally irrespective of what their level of ability is at a given point in time. And so the things that were used as project inputs for that were um, the Microsoft 365 Cloud for Nonprofit. In this case, the customer service capabilities that, that are part of the Microsoft Dynamics family. Um, it just makes sense to start with that or rather than reinvent the wheel. Um, they also use marketing and voice for other levels of engagement. And then because there's a lot of portal in this, uh, what are now called power pages are the foundational infrastructure whereby there's a secure access to that core Microsoft Cloud for nonprofit and customer service related information or constituent self-service information as well. Um, so that's the major ingredients. And then up next are first and foremost, um, a lot of basic refinements now that the organization is getting used to working in the new system um, and then potentially extending that programmatic work all the way up into fundraising so that they can kind of connect the donor relationships into um, the outbound services and inventory management that they do within the system today um, and trying to connect that dollars to outcomes view as well. So um, the organization is very much in a state of evolution, uh, which is, I think, good for all, all parties involved and their stakeholders. And uh, we hope to continue to learn how to mold the system as they begin to scale um, into the future. This, uh, any questions on that or any hands up? Let me just take a quick check. So far, so good. We have a question um, from Peter Casada. Does anyone have any recommendations on a Dynamics CRM implementer? Peter, I won't answer that because my answer is going to be biased, um, but <laughs> I'll be very happy to have others uh, share their experiences here as well, right? Uh, our, we, we always love to have um, an opportunity to speak with people about doing that implementation work. And um, there are many great partners in the Microsoft ecosystem. I'm very happy to talk with you. <laughs> He's like, he said he doesn't care about the bias. <laughs> feel, free to, feel free to consider us. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm gonna take you down a different path on this next one because this, this, is, this is for, uh, this is a great, example of how large organizations with lots of different technologies uh, in use across a global scale can um, can use the CDM to their advantage, irrespective of fealty to different platforms, right? And so this is one of my favorite examples. Um, we had the, the good fortune of, of having a longstanding relationship with a, a, a very large international humanitarian aid organization that, that we've worked with through actually a couple of different um, or companies now. And one of the challenges um, that they were experiencing was that that uh, they, they were seeing inefficiencies in their kind of global application design and development process because they didn't have a common data language around the common activities and processes uh, that the organization was employing, right? And this ranges from money in to money out um, to uh, resettlement to a whole host of other activities. There are tens of thousands of members of this organization. Um, and so when those dis distributed teams were trying to work on or share processes, property, assets, methods with each other, they're finding that it was very difficult to have those conversations and they were feeling a lot of slowdown because they didn't have a common language around the, about how to describe the things that they did and the, the data entities that they were working with. So we engaged with them in a project. Uh, they had the intended impact of accelerating their development pipeline um, as the interim objective, but ultimately so that they could provide faster and better responsiveness to their own teams as they would 
engage in the application development life cycle, right? By using this common language. Uh, and the primary uh, participants in that were the data architects and the business analysts that were participant. The basic output of the project was we ran a series of common data model for nonprofit educational workshops uh, and, had, and created a lot of educational content around the concepts, including leveraging all the publicly available content so that they could take that and spread it around their, amongst their teams. So we did that through, uh, I think, seven different workshops and a couple hundred pages of content, um, all of which were then spread across the organization to try to, to get those concepts out into the market. Um, the inputs, you can see here, they didn't use any technology. This is a totally non-technology technology project uh, because they have Microsoft, they have Blackbaud's products, they have Salesforce, they have Oracle, they've got NetSuite, they have, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, they, their intent was to take that knowledge and then use it in whatever the best tool was, depending on what the context was. Um, so we actually didn't do any technological work. Uh, and then you can see here on their roadmap, the, the plan is to just apply, apply and extend those common data model designs across their ecosystem of applications to the extent that it makes sense to do so. Uh, and then fill also fill in gaps where the CDM doesn't provide coverage so that they can develop and share that common data language and accelerate their, their um, service to their own application development processes. These are really fun projects for us because we get to uh, kind of share the work that we've been part of for the last five years or so and helping to contribute to the CDM. Um, and we also get to work with really opinionated data architects and application architects who feel really strongly about the way things should be built or the way things should be described. And so they're, they're wonderful for us as a team because we also get to learn a lot from some of the smartest people out there. So let's go to the next example, which is healthcare. Um, we, uh, we do a reasonable amount of work with healthcare foundations. And what I mean by this are, are nonprofit hospitals uh, in the United States that have arms and divisions that raise funds. And so, this is an example of, of a healthcare foundation that was initially challenged with some cybersecurity threats uh, that put their constituent data at risk. Um, but they also had a lot of manual operations shipping data around to try to aggregate their kind of omni channel fundraising efforts into a single CRM. Um, they are um, one of the most professional organizations I've seen in a long time in terms of their processes. So I want to note that. While there were no official data integrations, every manual data integration at this organization was described perfectly in documentation and instruction. And the team was doing a brilliant job of manual integrations where human intervention um, was involved. Um, but really what they know they need to do is they need to double their revenue right, within a period of time. And so to do that, they needed to provide significant efficiencies to this to the team uh, and get replatformed on you know, a fully integrated end-to-end -end fundraising um, operation that's backed up by a system that will support that. Uh, and their end game is ultimately really to, to do, do more uh, scalable one-to-one -one constituent personalization fueled by integrated technologies that have visibility to that information where they should um, in a healthcare context. So the output of the first phase is just move move this organization from where they are now uh, into the fundraising engagement application and a reasonable amount of customizations that meet the specific needs of healthcare foundations uh, and, <clears throat> and do that in a context where they also gain the advantage of, of interoperable and bidirectional integrations um, that are connected to the patient management systems um, fed into wealth and screening processes, <clears throat> and then can also handle things like batch gift processing and entry at scale, um, where um, development operations staff are looking at every single record on the way through to ensure that the wishes of the donor are respected in that process, among many other things. So the primary output of this first phase was really a replatforming exercise. Uh, and in the effort of that, the, the key things that went into this were that the organization was already making um, significant moves into kind of the Microsoft space. So lots of work on the front office. The whole team already used the office suite, including Outlook and Teams. As I mentioned, 
Um, they use fundraising and engagement as part of the cloud for nonprofit, which takes that dependency on, on Dynamics 365 sales. Real-time marketing is a must-have uh, in my book for anybody doing fundraising uh, with Microsoft. It is, in my view, one of the most significant competitive advantages that Microsoft has because it's built into the CRM instead of attached to it um, as a third-party app, even if it's under the same brand. And then this is uh, the Power Apps down to Azure is where a lot of that configuration and customization came through to support the fairly sizable operations of this organization, um, which is the benefit of being in the Microsoft space. So what's next? Um, you know, we're they've been live for a little while. There's lots of enhancements to be made, right? And the team is learning how to move from a very good but legacy and disconnected system into a fully interoperable platform. Um, we're learning with them through the process, as uh, this is um, not the first major healthcare institution we've worked with, but we're we're uh, we're continuing to learn through that. And at the end of the day, what we all want to do is empower their fundraisers. We want to we want to give them more time uh, and better transparency into their uh, complex donor relationships, so that they can continue to personalize those engagements and help this organization double their revenue, right? So that they can deploy those funds inside of the organization for innovation. So that's the healthcare use case, and the last one that we're going to go through before I get to uh, a couple of quick wrap ups. Um, I think we're good on time, right, Bea? So far <clears throat> is an education. Are, yes. This uh, this organization, education as a causal area, is is um, I think one that's very easy to get behind. And so this this is an example that I think we're really proud of, um, where the organization is, is focused on ensuring that people have access to and support around education uh, about things that are personal and important to their identity as well as their bodies, uh, which I think we we uh, we know is critical in the world we live in today. They, they were on a on-premise uh, CRM system uh, with Microsoft and they knew that um, to uh, ensure the security uh, and provide a more scalable platform they needed to get off of that, right? So that was the primary driver um, was to get off of that on-premise and then also uh, that on-premise application, which was only supporting some of their programs to create a foundation that could support all of their programs. So the intended impact was really about, um, first and foremost, protecting the constituent data, uh, because that is sacrosanct in their, their world, as it is, I think, for all of us that are here. But as I mentioned um, just a second ago, they also really wanted to think about how, how could the organization best mold and shape its programs such that um, they could do this at scale and really understand how how could they provide um, multiple layers of support over a longitudinal relationship with people um, that that chose to engage with them um, as um, stakeholders so the system was intended to bring all of that together um, the immediate output of the project was was that really a lift and shift and an enhancement exercise um, so the idea was get to the cloud Right, learn from everything that's in the on-premise space and what's what's gone been gone down there. But the transfer is relatively easy because it's it's not apples to apples, but it's sort of apples to oranges. So it's a little closer than shifting from a third-party system. Uh, and then improve the processes and sort of pilot across programs. Um, and then I'll talk about roadmap in a second. But this this is <laughs> a quick view of what was used to make this happen. Yeah. Fundraising is not part of this project at all and very much uh, likely will never be, mostly because the organization fundraises at a national level. Right? And this is within an affiliate organization and as part of that national organization. So um, so we didn't use fundraising engagement at all. And, and we really just used the common data model for nonprofits as the baseline. Uh, and then uh, we extended that using the Power Platform capabilities with all the data stored in Dataverse. And then you use real-time marketing um, to ensure that that constituent engagement and journeys can can be facilitated throughout the course of the the project and the constituents life cycle. So next up is extension of those initial pilots to all of their programs. Um, and their real hope is that they'll be able to increase the digital engagement across more of their channels, leveraging that that marketing capability um, that's built into the system as well. So, with that, we also um, said in the course of this that we were going to talk a little bit about the thing that everybody's talking about, which is this logo that probably everybody recognizes uh, about AI. And um, rather than lead with this, 
we we like to follow with it, right? Because the experience that we're having with organizations that we're lucky enough to work with is more like this, right? This is what the AI conversation feels like with the customers that, that we have and with people that are thinking about it. There are there are lots of questions. It's not organized. Um, everybody's experimenting, right? But everybody's also trying to do this in a way that's going to be safe, right? Um, for their constituents, most importantly, and right next to that for their team, right? And for the people that work at their organization. So, <clears throat> so we're let me be very clear, we are very bullish on AI, and we're also very cautious about how to learn uh, with the market as we work our way through this. So there's two things that um, two things that I'll share on this, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to move through this relatively quickly, but very happy, as I mentioned, to send the Miro boards afterwards, is that we, you know, we do think you should get started in a way that is um, that protects your constituent and your team information. So there are uh, four solutions that we've worked on inside of the Microsoft space that uh, one of which Microsoft published already and is available on GitHub, which is a fundraising proposal assistant. And then we're planning on putting three more out over the course of the next few months. If you have any interest in these, please reach out. Right? And essentially what these do is, uh, and I have pictures of each of them below, is they, they all function in the same way. They take information inside of Microsoft Dataverse into context. Uh, they provide the user with an opportunity for input, and then it engages with OpenAI and ChatGPT, and it provides a draft response that the user remains in control of. Right? And that's the entire flow. And we think that's a really excellent model for exper experimentation. So the fundraising assessment does this, it takes all of the proposal information into context. It asks the user if it wants to add any additional context, which could be anything from like write, write a proposal in French or write it from the perspective of our head of the uh, development, Bea. Um, and then it'll attach a draft proposal back into the opportunity which is where fundraising and engagement expects that kind of information to go. And then the user gets to decide if they want to edit it and or send it out. Um, the second version does a similar thing in that um, if anybody here, and I know there's some foundations on the line, if, you, if you're if you receiving grants either through open proposals or through online, um, uh, through invited grants, this will take a full list of applications that you get to pick and it'll provide you with a summary of your liking that you can then attach to a docket and then send that off to either a review committee or uh, perhaps to the board or whoever the group of uh, individuals is. It's not intended to replace the full applications by any measure. Um, and we know that you respect all of the detail that people take the time to put into your grant applications. Uh, but this gives you a quicker, a quick way to summarize it. It can save you a huge amount of time in trying to summarize 100 or 200 applications that have come through. Um, and there's a couple of more. Uh, I won't go through these in great detail, but um, just I'll flash them up on the screen. And then again, we'll be happy to share these afterwards. Is this helps write gift acknowledgments, taking into context the information uh, about your constituents to try to personalize it. And this is one that's um, I think will probably get replaced by just basic co-pilot in Microsoft Space, which is you know case management response assistance to try to help facilitate uh, faster and more contextual responses. So, so this is the kind of work we're experimenting with inside of the Power Platform. And then, uh, and we love this work and we hope that um, people will ask us to ideate on this with them uh, and build these type, types of scenarios as well. So open invitation to anybody that wants to follow this process or method <laughs> to try to experiment with AI with us. Um, but we also have something that's a little more accessible here at Threshold called Beat Out World which is a uh, online impact measurement and storytelling app that has lots of AI already built into it. And you can do free trials of this. It's sign up and go. Uh, and it does things like, um, I'll show you four quick examples. It'll help you build a project or a program by cutting and pasting or draft or connecting it to a URL from your website. It'll help you draw visual results frameworks um, based on your project definition. 
it'll help you summarize your data and it'll also help you write impact stories using OpenAI. So if you want to just play with something uh, and maybe share this with your program teams, this is like a, you could be up and running in five minutes, whereas the Power Platform examples, as you would expect, because they're built in the Power Platform, take more effort and energy to, to kind of get up and running and install and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, again, we're really excited about this conversation. We just think it's going to be messy and we need to we need to experiment in a safe way going forward. Um, we were at the Nonprofit Leaders Summit uh, with Microsoft uh, a couple of months ago. And we put this out on LinkedIn, but it, one of the favorite things, my mo favorite moments of the entire um, conference was, was just walking down the hallway and there was a, a an attendee that said, you know, everybody keeps saying just like start small. Right. And like and, and her response was like, well, what? It, I need to know what start small looks like. Like, what does that look like? Everybody's saying, like, put a toe in the water, do it safely, be responsible, follow the ethical principles. All, all of that is valid, right? But we think the most important thing is like, well, well, that's great. And do something, like build something, download something, do it in an environment where there's zero risk, right? Don't put anything in it that you're concerned about, right? And follow all those ethical principles, but get hands on. And I think that the Power Platform examples that we're sharing here, as well as Beat World as a fully self-service sign up and go application, are great practical, accessible uses of AI um, that hopefully will provide people with inspiration to go do their own great things. So with that, I promised that I would come back to the punchline um, when we started. I hope, I, I sincerely hope that this has been a good use of your time and we will stay for questions if anybody has them, but I also want to make sure we wrap up on schedule. Uh, I often get asked, um, <clears throat> you know, what are the unifying themes across the organizations we're working with, right? And and it really comes to these three things. And I, and I hope I've given you good examples of them that, um, that will be useful in your own conversations or again, serve as inspiration. Um, the first is that th this, this idea of the common data model it manifests in Microsoft Dataverse or whatever technology is of choice for your organization. Uh, if you don't use Microsoft, it provides the best cross organizational example of data and its definitions that's available in the market today. And being able to put that in place and be able to see how a constituent that supports your organization because they're responding to a campaign uh, and the, the restricted and or unrestricted split designation of funds is flowing into the appropriate places and it's, that's attached to projects and programs or flowing out through, you know, funded budgets connected to your outbound grants. Um, it, that substrate provides a level of safety for organizations knowing that you can move and change the applications on top of that as things evolve, but you're on the strongest foundation available in the market. And you're not locked into it as a design. You can extend it to the extent that you need to. So that combo of the cloud for nonprofit plus the dataverse is uh, the thing that you know personally I have been kind of hoping existed in the market for 15 years, and and we, now we've been implementing it for the last five, um, and I'm really proud to to be able to be a part of that. Um, the second thing is that. I probably said this three or four times in the examples, everybody wants to connect the dollars to the outcomes, right? Or outcomes to dollars. And whether you're a fundraising organization that's, that really is trying to demonstrate the efficacy of your stewardship of people's support, or you're a program related team that needs to seek funding, um, there, there, there doesn't need to be a technical barrier between connecting to dollars to outcomes anymore. At the same time, um, you know, you shouldn't try to do it all at the same time. Like take a phased approach like the examples that um, that we shared. Uh, that's I'm not the first person on that. I know certainly won't be the last person to provide that advice. Um, and then the final one is that, you know, people want to be feel confident that their data, uh, their data house is in order as they prepare for AI. And, and the reason why we put it in the order that we did is that we find, we believe that organizations that feel safe with where their data is stored and feel safe with the, the platforms that they're building on um, and come up with specific use cases that will drive business value, will get much more out of the AI journey. It's not terribly difficult to leverage AI in the context of the Microsoft suite. Um, in the front office, you know, there's a co-pilot for everything now, 
right? And we're users of it, we're students of it. Uh, we're very happy to share those journeys, but, uh, but the best value will come when your data house is in order, right? And so um, it doesn't have to be a get to it later kind of a thing. It really should be an experiment while you're along the journey sort of a thing so that you, we, um, we can learn through the process and continue to make it better. But, um, but ultimately, these are the three main things that we hear about is we want to have a great foundation. We need to connect things across the organization. Uh, and we need technologies that make that easier than it's been historically with other legacy cloud offerings. And we want to be prepared for when we're ready to pull the trigger with AI and get to work. So I am going to stop talking and start listening. And um, again, we are very happy to share the content. I am uh, tremendously grateful that so many of you decided to show up today. I, I feel honored um, and complimented for that. And, uh, and I, I truly hope it's been a good use here.